The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. So I'm a member of the Apache Software Foundation. Um, and I spend most of my time working on Apache Cloud Stack. Um, but that's really uh, kind of a different role that I've stepped into in the past couple of years. Um, I have historically been an operations guy, and uh, I describe myself as a recovering sysadmin, which means that I, uh, I still remember that it's down and not across. Um, before, I, uh, before I started working pretty actively on Cloud Stack, um, I was a contributor to the Fedora project, and I still do some work there. Um, but I used to be a, uh, spend a lot more time working on Fedora. I also worked on Xenos, which is a monitoring package, uh, naturally because I was a sysadmin and needed to monitor things. Um, for about the past uh, year or so, uh, year and a half, I've been employed by Citrix, and I work in the open source business office, uh, which allows me to spend a good chunk of my time on CloudStack. So to set your expectations, this is a wildly opinionated talk. Um, it's not even uh, so much a talk about, um, uh, about any specific technology. It's not a really deep talk uh, from a technical perspective. Uh, it's really a talk about uh, my path from um, being a uh, bastard operator from hell to uh, someone who is actively working on cloud projects. Um, so I also make plenty of prognostications, um, and uh, you'll see some of those as we go along. So a little more background about me. So I said I was a recovering sysadmin. What that really means is that I used to be a server hugger. Um, I, I used to uh, be one of the organizers for self. Uh, in the, the first three years. Uh, and I, I used to have a rule for talks that if your talk mentioned cloud, uh, it would never appear uh, as a uh, presentation itself. Um, I used to think that cloud computing was uh, a disaster waiting to happen, that you know, essentially it was trying to bypass IT. Um, and then I had a sl sudden cloudy conversion uh, akin to uh, a religious experience, a Damascus Road experience, um, and found myself going from server hugger to someone who had a cloud.com email address uh, in a period of uh, six months or so. So let's, uh, let's talk about the status quo in operations today, right? So here's a story. Someone starts a new project that has something to do with IT. So they start asking for resources. Uh, and so they file a ticket, right? Because hopefully you're, it's not go visit, uh, go visit Joe and say, hey, I need, uh, I need a server, or I need um, an app server that I can run some software on. Uh, hopefully they, you actually have a ticket, ticketing system uh, to make those requests. And then you have to wait. So then uh, depending upon your organization uh, and, and where you are in that organization, you may get resources. And a lot of times those resources aren't configured. So maybe they ordered you real hardware, uh, and the hardware arrives, but it's not racked, it's not cabled. Uh, it certainly doesn't have an operating system installed. So you have to wait on that. Um, then there's an entirely different group that manages network access. Sometimes there's two or three different network groups that you have to deal with. Um, so while you've got this power, you've got power running to the server, uh, you've, got, uh, you've got the network cables all plugged in, but they don't actually have network connectivity. So then you have to ask for network access, uh, which requires getting permission, telling them exactly what you want to do, and then waiting. Um, uh, my, uh, my favorite example of this is actually one from the company that I work for. So I uh, went a few weeks back uh, and installed about 10 machines in a rack in a data center uh, that was going to be a lab environment for our group. And we'd been working on this since February. So February this year, we said, hey, 
we're going to have some equipment we need to place. They found us a place, they got us power, they got us a brand new rack, uh, got all of the PDUs in the rack, and when we were there, we could just slide the machines in and go. I still don't have network access to any of the machines in that rack. Um, uh, it is now June, and so from February to June, we're not able to get permission and uh, still working on getting permission and getting people to, to allow us to connect all of those machines to the network. Um, and then finally, after you've gone through all of this hassle, you can get things done. Uh, that, that is the status quo in ops today. And uh, anyone have a situation better than this? Tell me about your situation then. So, so from the time an app owner requests resources to the time they get them, what's your timeline for doing that? Most of it is going through approval process of managers, but the time that, that the bill team gets the ticket, it's less than 24 hour turnaround. That's pretty good. So um, I get, for better or worse, I get to talk to a lot of organizations. Um, and I talked to a, uh, the director of ops at a digital media company um, a few months back. Uh, they had completely moved to virtualization two years, uh, two years before we had the conversation. So everything was a virtual machine. Uh, you would think that that simplifies things, right? So uh, much less to rack and cable. Um, it's easier to hand things out. It's also easier to allow other people to do things. Uh, their timeline to get a machine, uh, a resource when it was requested out to someone was still eight weeks. Um, uh, I've had conversations uh, with other organizations who do incredible research, right? Uh, they, have, uh, they have a supercomputing facility and it takes them 12 weeks, eight weeks to get a resource. Um, think, about, think about the kind of delay that that introduced. So this status quo is uh, that we focus on control and permission. Um, and we don't actually focus on allowing people to get things done. Uh, I think this, quite honestly, is disastrous for IT in general. Um, we've, also, we've also become far more central to the business. So there are very few things uh, that, um, that, are, that businesses do today that do not interact with IT in some uh, fashion or another. So one of my previous employers was a manufacturing company. Uh, they manufactured kayaks and um, they essentially could not manufacture a single kayak without the IT systems in place. Even though uh, you know, it's essentially a boat, uh, actually getting it manufactured from whether it's controlling the, uh, the molding and injection machines to uh, actually printing the Coast Guard registration uh, documents to uh, recording in the MRP system that that boat exists. Essentially, if one or more of those systems went down, an entire uh, manufacturing line, and that is as uh, free from technology as I know uh, of a business to be, but it still was core to actually getting things done. And the problem is, is that uh, we've gone from, uh, I think, being slightly disaffected and ignored by the business as, as something that uh, adds a little bit of value to being core to the business 
and we've built a fiefdom around operations so that we essentially tell everyone that they must come and, uh, and bow before us and to get whatever we want. And uh, we act as if, uh, as if it is ours to dispense. Um, the problem that that creates is that the constraint is worse than ever. Uh, so if you want to get things done, it is far harder to get things done now than it was a few years ago, generally speaking. Um, people actually hate interacting with operations now. Uh, if you work in an IT shop, a, a traditional IT shop, chances are your coworkers despise having to come and ask you for resources. Um, and we also, and, and this is, I think, uh, plays back to our geek culture, um, we have a maniacal focus on technology. Uh, we care about the bright, shiny tools, uh, and we lose sight of the fact that we are there to actually deliver value for the business. But some other things have been going on as well, right? So uh, much of the, uh, the processes that we uh, provide uh, and that we step through have become a commodity. Um, you know, whether it's, uh, whether it's having a CRM system, uh, that's a commodity now effectively. Who cares about the, the differences between individual CRM systems? If I need something and I need it fast, I can go to salesforce.com and I can consume it. I can go to Sugar CRM and consume it. Uh, and I no longer need to interact with IT. Uh, same, thing with, same thing with access to machines. I can plop down a credit card and get access to AWS. So this has led to a lot of people bypassing IT um, and, uh, and effectively shadow IT coming into existence. So uh, I had a chance to have dinner recently with um, the CTO of the largest retailer in the world. Um, and we were sitting down and talking and he was essentially expressing their vision for IT for the next few years. And people said, hey, we heard about this particular initiative coming out of, uh, of your company. And he said, that is not a central IT initiative. It was a gigantic um, nine-figure uh, uh, deal for, uh, for IT services, and it wasn't, didn't involve IT at all. Um, essentially, a, a department had said, you know, we can no longer uh, operate under the constraints of IT. We will go spend our money on our own without allocating it to centralized IT. And essentially, they were working their way around. Uh, working their way around IT to get things done. Um, when you have a company with, that is publicly traded, that has all the compliance issues that publicly traded companies have, that is large, uh, massively large on a global scale, and they have to bypass centralized IT, um, you know, there's something wrong, right? Um, so I, I also, uh, about, uh, about a year ago, I had to, a conversation with a really large software vendor. Uh, they sell about uh, $50 billion worth of software a year. And uh, their discovery was that, uh, that their request for service for their operations folks were, was at an all-time low. And they thought, man, we must be doing a really good job because the queue's low. Uh, people aren't requesting things. And they started looking into this because they said, you know, we're doing things. We ought to make a case study out of how we're doing things so well and tell our customers to go do this. And so they started looking around, and one of the things that they discovered was that individual development managers were, uh, were expensing AWS environments. Uh, so there would be 30 or 40 uh, different AWS environments for any given project. And the developers were doing all of their work in AWS because centralized IT was taking so long to respond that it was killing all of their project timelines. Uh, one of the things that I found as, we, as, we, uh, as I continue to talk to people is that if you do not work in a SCIF, and if you don't know what a SCIF is, then you don't work in one, um, uh, that you have people uh, that are using Amazon to get their work done or some other public cloud provider. 
that has become a ubiquitous problem across all enterprises. And for the places that have to deal with compliance, it's a nightmare. Um, so essentially, shadow IT has come in and said, you know, traditional IT, traditional operations uh, is not satisfying me. I can plop down a credit card and I can do, uh, get my needs met far more easily. And uh, people are doing that. And that is the status quo today. Uh, a lot of times, the shadow IT organization is actually larger in number of nodes than uh, the traditional operations is at this point. So this is the status quo. Um, and we're going to take a couple of detours. So I'm going to talk a little bit about cloud. Um, and uh, so cloud is, these are the different cloud service models. And I don't want to bore anyone. Anyone not familiar with infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service? OK, Joe, you can read while I talk. Um, so there are, uh, there are a number of things. And cloud computing is really focused on a couple of things. And uh, to quote Dave Nielsen, cloud is awesome, which is on-demand, self-service, scalable, and measurable. Uh, so on-demand means that a user can, anytime they need to consume a resource, they can get access to it and provision it uh, when they want to and get that within a matter of minutes. Uh, Self-service uh, means that uh, they don't need to have you interact with them. So uh, they don't need to file a ticket with you to get access to those resources. Uh, not only can they get it when they need it, they can do it themselves. So scalable means that it gives the appearance that there are limitless resources. Um, I think this is the most tenuous uh, element in cloud computing. but. Uh, essentially, for most of the applications, most of the people who will be consuming your services, they do not run into limits. Um, at the same time, virtually every uh, cloud uh, environment has limits. So if you plug in your credit card to Amazon, they have a default limit of five machines. So you cannot provision more than five machines without talking to Amazon about it. Uh, and of course, measurable. You want to be able to measure uh, what you're consuming. So you may get charged based on the resources you're consuming rather than flat rates or, or something else. But cloud's really an automation enabler, right? So um, cloud computing, uh, particularly infrastructure as a service and platform as a service, those are really, uh, those are really just automation tools, uh, which makes them uninteresting unless you're an operations person. So it's getting all of those processes out of the way and automating them uh, in a manner that uh, allows people to get things done. So if you have a process right now that allocates an IP address but goes before some network review board, um, chances are you're, you're not adding value by putting it before the review board. And you could codify all of the policies that you want to apply. So no group can have more than n number of IP addresses. Um, you don't allow uh, these firewall rules, uh, or you don't allow a certain uh, number of ports to be exposed to the internet. Uh, all of those things are things that you can apply as policies that still allow you to have some control, but don't require you to have manual processes. Um, and so I would argue that the vast majority of manual processes, even if they're approval processes, uh, do not add value anymore. Uh, so cloud computing is a wonderful tool, uh, it's, uh, but it's a tool. And it's something that you have to actually consume uh, as a tool. So let's talk a little bit about DevOps. Uh, you can't read this because it's really small. Uh, these are the, uh, uh, the 14 goals uh, set out by uh, Edward Deming. Um, and Deming is a guy who wrote, uh, who, who went over to Japan after World War II and uh, essentially set up the automotive industry in Japan and made it so incredibly effective. Um, uh, let me just read through these for you. And, and essentially, these 14 goals have been, uh, have been espoused by the, uh, the DevOps movement. 
So create constancy of purpose towards improvement of product and service with the aim to become competitive, stay in business, and to provide jobs. Adopt the new philosophy. We are in a new economic age. Western management must awaken to the challenge, must learn their responsibilities, and take on leadership for change. Cease dependence on inspection to achieve, quali to achieve quality. Eliminate the need for massive inspection by building quality into the product in the first place. Improve constantly and forever the system of production and service to improve quality and productivity and thus constantly decrease costs. Institute training on the job. Institute leadership. The aim of supervision should be to help people and machines and gadgets do a better job. Supervision of management is in need of overhaul as well as supervision of production workers. Drive out fear so that everyone may work effectively for the company. Break down barriers between departments. People in research, design, sales, and production must work as a team in order to foresee problems of production and usage that may be encountered with the product or service. Eliminate slogans, exhortations, and targets for the workforce asking for zero defects and new levels of productivity. Such exhortations only create adversarial relationships as the bulk of the causes of low quality and low productivity belong to the system and thus lie beyond the power of the workforce. Eliminate work standards or quotas on the factory floor. Substitute with leadership. Eliminate management by objective. Eliminate management by numbers and numerical goals. Instead, substitute with leadership. Remove barriers that rob the hourly worker of his right to pride of workmanship. The responsibilities of supervisors must be changed from sheer numbers to quality. Remove barriers that rob people in management and in, and in engineering of their right to pride of workmanship. This means inter alia, abolishment of the annual or merit rating and of management by objectives. Institute a vigorous program of education and self-improvement. Put everybody in the company to work to accomplish the transformation. The transformation is everybody's job. Um, I despise reading from slides, but I think that these 14 uh, uh, elements are key to, uh, key to a transformation in IT. The sad fact, though, is that this has been around since the 40s. Um, and we have thought that IT is such a different discipline uh, that we didn't care to learn from the rest of the business world. And as much of a geek as I am, uh, there's more to IT than, uh, than playing with the cool, shiny tools. So I would recommend, this is, this is a little heady reading, but Out of the Crisis by Edward Deming should be on your reading list. Um, those 14 things, though, were wordy, right? So uh, Damon Edwards and John Willis uh, kind of crystallized what DevOps means into uh, culture, automation, measurement, and sharing. Uh, so I, I think that the key issue really is culture. Uh, and just to talk a little bit about culture, uh, I talked about uh, operations erecting a fiefdom, right? So. Uh, when a developer wants a resource, they come to operations and ask for the resource. Operation typically hands it off to them uh, and then never looks back. Development then goes and does their own thing. They create an application and then they toss it over the wall and say, hey, I'm done. Check it out, build it, and, and go run it in production. Um, and they, they never look back, right? Uh, which means operations has this thing that they don't really know how to operate, that they're then responsible for getting into production and the business then depends upon it. Uh, and often development and operations never come together to work. Um, so if you go back to, if you come back here, uh, break down barriers between departments, I think is one of the key uh, issues that, that we have problems with. As we've uh, erected these, uh, these fiefdoms, particularly in operations, um, and uh, not that uh, operations is completely at fault here, but uh, we've essentially made it more difficult for people to work with us uh, and made our jobs more difficult in the process. So 
when we're talking about a DevOps culture, we're, we're focusing on uh, ensuring that operations is working for the good of the business and interoperating with the other groups in the business. Uh, so I get to uh, travel around and I get to hang out with John Willis and, and to a lesser degree, Damon Edwards. Um, and so I'm, I said, uh, John, you know, this sounds a lot like uh, the books my dad used to read uh, when I was much younger. And we started talking about the goal. Uh, this is another book, uh, and it really talks about the theory of constraints. Um, this is a novel about, uh, um, about a uh, factory that's a uh, manufacturing company that's having problems uh, and about to go under. Uh, they introduced lots of automation. They've got robots. Uh, and yet, uh, the company is still on the verge of going under. Uh, I absolutely recommend that you add this book to your reading. Uh, it's much more parsable than uh, Out of the Crisis. Um, and uh, you'll start to see a lot of, a lot of uh, similarities between that manufacturing world and, uh, and the current world of uh, IT operations. Um, anyway, so, so this has also become kind of one of those books that even though it deals with a field completely different, because of the theories that it uh, introduces, uh, the DevOps world has started consuming it. But you know, this, is, this is something that uh, isn't easily translatable, I would argue, uh, into the operations world. So if you want to look at the future of IT, um, I think you should uh, buy the Phoenix Project. How many of you have not read the Phoenix Project? How many of you have not heard of the Phoenix Project before today? OK, so we'll take a little break right here while you jump on Amazon.com. This is, I, I'm not kidding, this is the most important book that I can tell you about. Um, reading it will, um, will either scare you or it will uh, inspire you. And it should be the next book that you read, period. Uh, you will gain, if you work in an operations or uh, the development side of the house, uh, this particular book is the most valuable book you can be reading, period. Um, I, I bought, I, so I know one of the authors uh, who's Gene Kim, um, who's, uh, he also wrote a book called Visible Ops. Uh, and he's got a couple of other books uh, in process right now. Um, when this came out, I bought it the day that, uh, that it came out. I literally couldn't put it down. I started reading at uh, 11. I didn't get any sleep. Uh, I, it took me till about 5 a.m. to finish the book. Um, and uh, I could not put it down. And uh, I would, uh, I'd be willing to bet that it will be career changing for you if you have not uh, if you're interested in DevOps, if you work in operations or development. Um, so the Phoenix Project by Gene Kim, uh, really it should be something that you ordered while I was running my mouth. So the problem is that creates a, uh, a beautiful picture of where you can go. It does uh, outline some of the difficulties, but that's the future of IT only if we adapt. Um, So we have this, we build all of these silos, these fiefdoms. Uh, we have culture that is very difficult to change. Uh, if you, uh, John Allspaw, who, uh, who's at Etsy, who's one of the great, I, I would argue, one of the great DevOps success stories. Um, they, uh, if you talk to him, he says, you cannot change culture. Uh, that's the most difficult thing. While culture is the uh, core, uh, one of the core th elements of DevOps is having the right culture and a culture that works together. You cannot directly change culture. You can change behavior, and then um, once you've changed behavior, uh, that can slowly become culture, but that's a uh, process over time, and it also requires buy-in of management. Um, which is all the more difficult. Uh, the big change, though, is we must stop uh, becoming, we must stop being this island of operations and IT and assume that uh, we are special 
uh, and that nobody understands the work that we do. Um, the reason that we are special is because we enable the business to get things done and to do things more efficiently. So we must become a partner to the business. Uh, and as much as the geek in me hates business talks, I think that, uh, I think that if we don't do this, if we don't start adapting and becoming a partner, people will continue to avoid us, uh, people will work around us, we'll become irrelevant. I'd argue that in many cases we already are. Um, look, at, look at your provisioning process today. Uh, how many of you have uh, Amazon AWS accounts? How many folks in here work in operations? So go get yourself an Amazon account. Plop down your credit card. Uh, they have a free offering. Does Linode count? Linode counts, right. So <laughs> Amazon's a, Amazon is a placeholder for, uh, for a cloud provider. Look at how easy it is for someone to provision a virtual machine. And then compare that to your process. Um, anyone remember, anyone work in IT when, when these were around? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the moment you move to production, you have to get us involved because don't call me at 3 a.m. because your Amazon server is screwed. Sure. I'm not going to log in. But, call, but, but if you call about a production server running on our hardware that I provision, I can fix it in a few minutes. I don't have to spend half an hour trying to figure out your setup because you provision it. So, so I would argue that, uh, go ahead. I have a counterpoint to that. Netflix runs the entire operation out of, out of Amazon cloud. That's, that's Netflix. That, that's a very unique case. That's not the no, standard. No, it shouldn't be. That, that's it not, shouldn't be. That, that's, not the, that's not the standard business. Right, but the standard business is doing it wrong is what I'm arguing. I, I, I disagree. I disagree. So, so I am the, I come from a traditional bastard operator from hell. Uh, let me architect something for you so that I can, I'm responsible for it when something goes wrong. Otherwise, don't call me if you're going to go out and do your, your own thing. Uh, the problem is, is that when we do that uh, as operations folks, we essentially say, you know, all of your concerns are not important. My concerns are the most important. And yes, there's, there's problems of responsibility. But uh, when someone can go and, and turn it up and it works 90% of the time, that's, that's compelling. And if, so if you can add engineering atop that to increase that 90% to 98, 99 or better, and still give them the flexibility, that's, uh, that's incredibly compelling as opposed to some of the timelines that we typically enforce. Uh, so the sad fact of the matter is that 68% of corporate IT projects fail. Uh, think about that when you start thinking about your timeline to provision, even the development side of the house is two months on average for a company. So you've got a two month investment uh, out of the gate and even at the end of that two month investment, 68% are guaranteed to fail. Hmm? You need to fail right. Failure is okay, right? Failure is going to happen. You just have to accept it. What you want to do is to be able to fail faster. Um, and you also, uh, you also want to ensure that you are... Um, we are getting to the point where it, we assume that failure uh, is going to happen. So traditionally, we used to spend lots of money buying um, impressive mainframes. And uh, if we did it right, we would have someone from IBM who had an office in our facility um, because they were there to service it and they would take responsibility for keeping that up. Uh, and that is very much like the let me engineer something for you so that at 3 a.m. I can still support it. Uh, we then decided, you know, that's great, but now we've got, uh, we've got these x86 machines that are cheap and they are, um, they're easily disposable. And the mainframe guys said, yeah, but you can't guarantee that they're going to be up all the time. They had a guy for that, though, right, who you could call at 3 a.m. Um, so we took on x86 hardware, right? 
And we had things like redundant power supplies. We had RAID for uh, disk failover. We had redundant fans. And it became cheaper. Um, and then we had virtualization, right? So now the, the underlying hardware platform doesn't matter nearly as much because we can move those virtual machines around. Um, and uh, we are continuing to push ourselves towards commoditization. Uh, we are continuing to get out of the everything must stay up all of the time. We will have people on site 24 seven to ensure that it stays running. Um, and we are getting much closer to, we assume that failure will happen. Uh, and I would argue that that is where we can start to add value. When we start to architect things um, much like Netflix has, so that failure is okay. Uh, something goes down, we have engineered our services so well, rather than our hardware, that it's not a problem. Yes? Yes, Chaos Monkey proactively goes and kills things, right? They do, and, and yes, yeah, so, so Netflix has, uh, they actually have a simian army, uh, and the simian army is a number of daemons that go out and will kill machines on Netflix, kill entire services, maybe even take, yeah, maybe even take out an entire availability zone uh, of machines that are running in that Netflix environment. And in the process of killing uh, all of those machines, they essentially are saying, if it hurts, we ought to do it more often until we, can, we have engineered ourselves to a place where it doesn't hurt anymore. Um, and uh, you know, that's, some of that is uh, automation, some of that is just better software engineering. Um, we've gone from, uh, we, we have historically had fragile applications that cannot tolerate failure. And so we engineered our hardware to be incredibly resilient. Uh, to tolerate faults without actually dying. Um, we're pushing closer to uh, commodity hardware with no redundancy, uh, with no fault tolerance. Um, and the people who seem to be the most successful at it seem to be engineering their services to tolerate the faults. Um, anyone familiar with the saying that, uh, that software is eating up the world? So software really is consuming the world. Everything is moving to software. Uh, and so that is the place where you need to start injecting, and, and this is much more of a developer uh, perspective, but you need to start injecting your uh, resiliency and your failover um, there rather than injecting it into the hardware and networking layers uh, because uh, software really is consuming the world. It's making the world much cheaper uh, to operate, and uh, we're driving down the cost of commodity machines. Uh, not that things like Amazon are necessarily cheap, but you can get a virtual machine uh, dirt cheap these days. I mean, Amazon will rent you one of their uh, M1 Micro for free forever, um, and you can consume that instance forever. You can do free computing. Red Hat will give you a platform as a service to run code on for free, forever. Um, computing resources are, are really in a race to the bottom. Um, and they are ever increasingly uh, easy to consume. Uh, and so people are. And uh, the business sees that agility and says, hey, we need that. We don't need the six month wait time to get a virtual machine provisioned for a development environment. Uh, and I would argue that they're going to work around you. The thing that they do not have, and, and this, is, this is the point you raised, they do not have the operations perspective. They can get it to stay up 80 or 90% of the time with no problem. Uh, and uh, that will lead them to running um, business critical or missions critical uh, applications at, in a place that, uh, that uh, is not architected properly from an operations perspective. They're doing that because it's easy to get around you to, to go do that. Uh, if you do not become a partner to those efforts and say, hey, yeah, running a single machine uh, uh, in Amazon that hosts the uh, kidney um, donor database 
is great, and that'll work 90% of the time. But when there's an S3 outage and you can't access the uh, donor database and you have people who uh, actively need kidneys, that's going to be a problem. But they could do it so fast that they completely went around their operations folks and then freaked out when they had an outage. Uh, so you have to become part of that conversation and telling people, hey, you can't go do things in the cloud or you can't, uh, you can't use these easily automated uh, consumable uh, tools is not going to work. People will, um, people will uh, uh, innovate around you because they can. And you can become either a partner to the business or you can become a backup tape changer. Um, one of my early IT friends um, did, was a backup tape changer in the early 80s. Uh, and he changed the massive reels from machines like this um, on a daily basis. Thought he had job security forever. Um, and uh, as we all know, you can store a lot more on uh, very small tapes now, and they have tape libraries, and uh, we're getting to the point where we don't even use tapes uh, anymore. Um, uh, when, when this went away, yes, when the Dell projector went away on Q, um, when that went away, uh, so did his job, uh, and he essentially never retrained. And I think a lot of us are, uh, are in denial about uh, the state of IT and how bad, um, how bad our relationship is with the business um, and how poorly we, um, uh, we interact towards the business goals with the rest of the business. Um, the simple fact of the matter is, is that we exist, our, our jobs exist uh, not to play with shiny new things as much as we love shiny new things. Uh, our jobs exist to, uh, to make the business better. And I think we often lose sight of that. Uh, and the business is rapidly growing tired of us. And uh, um, for better or worse, they are moving around us. Uh, and we can either be part of that conversation or we can not be part of that conversation and, and let people walk away from us. Anyone vehemently disagree? Want to flame me here publicly? Feel free to. Um, uh, any comments, questions, arguments? Can I comment as you know, a sure. world outsider? I mean, I'd never heard the word dead op, DevOps before yesterday, and I didn't know what it was this morning. So, but um, this whole, the whole talk you're talking about makes a lot of sense, and I, I keep, in my mind, I keep coming back to um, uh, uh, the, uh, Dilbert uh, Murdoch, the denier of information services. And, Morning. Mordak, is that who it is? Yeah. Mordak. Mordak, the denier of information services. And, and, and that's what I've heard you telling me that IT shops are becoming and, and that you should not become Murdak. Or, or I, I think IT shops have been that, right? So, yeah. I mean, we laugh about uh, bastard operator from hell, but that's really what we've been, right? Um, uh, we, have, we have created a culture of telling people, no, you will do it my way, um, rather than... Uh, is this new? It's, it's not. It's not. Uh, IT organizations have been that way. Uh, we are getting to the point where it is consumable and people can, can erect massive infrastructure without involving IT. Whether they do it right or not is a different matter. But they can do it easily. They can do it fast. There's yeah. an alternative. There's and? An alternative. It's not an easy alternative. Yeah, I, I clearly, I was, I was working with a, a group, um, this is, you know, a, 15 years ago, and, uh, and, and their IT group was going to come around and upgrade everybody's PC. And all the developers that I was working with, I was a consultant, you know, they'd dutifully stand back and let them install the latest operating system. And as soon as the guy was out of the room, they'd go in and reboot Linux, yeah. and reinstall Linux on top of it, and erase everything he had done. But it was much easier just to let him do his thing, think he was doing something, and then go back and set it up the way they needed it. Yeah. Yep than to argue with them and say, no, I don't want you to. Right, because then someone may actually come and inquire what yeah. they're doing. <laughs> what are you running on this machine? Yeah. And, and so I don't, you, what my point is, I don't think this is new. This no, is it's not new. The, the, the problem is not new. Um, the, fact that, the fact that it's much easier to get around people now, to get around the IT organization, is a development that is, uh, that is 
quite honestly, robbing power from IT operations. And so people are no longer stepping back and letting them do whatever they want. Uh, they can plop down a credit card. They can have massive Hadoop infrastructure or a massive, um, uh, a massive web presence and never have to interact with IT at all. Now, you're a DevOps person. Why aren't, the, why, why aren't the, the IT groups, why aren't they setting up their own little in-house limo or, or AWS it, groups? It's and, not, well, they are, so that's called the private cloud. Yeah. yeah. You also, I've, everyone I've, every presentation I've seen, it says you cannot do it. You cannot beat the price of Amazon. It'll be too expensive when you do it in-house. I, I disagree with that. So, so there's a... This, you've got other things as well, is that you know, the data is in-house. You, uh, yes. yeah, you own what you create rather than right. giving it away to another company. But, but the, the thing is not price. So it is how fa the, it, it's not dollars, right? So it's the cost of the people's time that you're employing, which is the real drain. Yeah. Um, the cost of a virtual machine in-house versus uh, externally. Yeah, it's going to be cheaper if you do it in-house. Uh, you can beat Amazon all day long. Um, a certain executive that works for the company that I worked for and went and quoted this uh, in violation of all kinds of SEC rules, um, he essentially went and picked out a company that was about to IPO and said, hey, these people were spending nine figures a year on Amazon, and they were able to reduce that um, by an order of magnitude by bringing it in-house. You can beat Amazon all day long on, on prices if, at, if you're doing it at any scale. Um, but that's not the value. The value is the agility and the speed to be able to innovate, to not keep people waiting to, hey, I've got a great idea. Let me go try it out. And even if it fails, it was you know, a week to fail to find out that it was a failure. It wasn't eight weeks of waiting and then a week to find out that it failed. Agility. Yes. Agility. Agility. It, it really is. Yes. We can't be safe. Don't call me. No, call me at all times. We have no. to do it. I, I would argue not even that. I would say go empower them to do it on their own and become, become the enabling agent that says, hey, I see that you guys are, have a need to do this really fast. Allow me to give you the power to go and provision your own stuff. Exactly. This isn't production. If you want to do production, let's go have a conversation about how to make that production ready. But as long as we're saying no, or we're saying, all right, in eight weeks or 12 weeks, you can come have your resource. People are going to walk all the way, uh, walk out of their way to get around you and go do it faster and cheaper elsewhere. The, the flip side of doing it, being able to set it up so quickly, they don't, they're not afraid to just let it shut down or let it go away. So right. You don't have this stuff sitting there idle because, oh, I, I might need it. I don't want to have to go through the expensive setup process again. I, I, I do think that there is still the sprawl issue. Um, so yeah, you forget it um, uh, to the point that I see people doing reservation engine type stuff for development environments. Uh, so you get a machine for you know a week, a month, or whatever, and then we'll just automatically destroy it. Um, but yeah, ab absolutely, and and you can be a part of the solution, or you will get innovated around, and you know when I see when I see eighty million dollar deals that are circum IT deals uh, that are circumventing central IT uh, at big companies, I'm like, this is $80 million. Even though you're a gigantic company, that's still a sizable chunk of money. And how, much, how much manpower that's, you know, that you just did away with, how much uh, resources you just did away with by sending it out for $80 million, yeah. where you can have it in-house, but the problem is to have that kind of resource in-house all the time requires the upfront spending. Sure. But so, you know, really, if you look at uh, the coup that is Salesforce.com, Salesforce.com said, hey, this is a traditional thing that you would go to IT, you would spend millions of dollars to bring up a, a CRM system. And uh, instead, we're essentially going to take that out of the IT uh, arena. And that becomes a sales or a marketing uh, consumption item. And uh, they are incredibly successful because you want to turn on salesforce.com, plop down a credit card. 30 minutes later, you'll have an environment up. 
uh, go tell your IT department you want to set up a new CRM system and, and see what they come back and tell you. And so I, I, I essentially make the argument that, uh, that you can either be a party to that and help enable people to get faster, or we, there are going to be vast numbers of operations people uh, out of jobs. Now, some of those jobs are crappy, right? So if your job today involves carrying around a CD uh, and installing a desktop or a server, your job actually should have been obsolete five years ago. Um, and, and the company that you're, uh, that you're working for, you're doing a disservice to because you ought to be setting up an automated provisioning system, right? Uh, there's no reason to manually install any operating system anymore. But if you have that kind of job, you are not going to have it in another five years. It will not exist unless you work in a really backwards company that is just happy to pay you money for doing worthless services. Um, and those type of companies are going to get their bread. They're going to have their lunch handed to them. Yes. Um, there's, a, there's a great story. Um, two online trading companies, uh, two online trading companies uh, were comparing costs and uh, I want to say it's between E-Trade and Ameritrade, and I don't remember which side this falls on. But uh, IT was such an enabling factor for them uh, that the company, uh, whichever one was, was the most efficient, did it fail again? Whichever company was the most efficient uh, at um, providing, uh, providing IT services, they were able to make their, uh, the cost to execute a trade uh, so cheap that they were offering services, they were offering trading services uh, to the public at a cost that was cheaper than the actual uh, cost to, for the, their competitor to execute the trade internally. That becomes, that becomes a simple matter of attrition at some point, right? continue executing enough trades and you will, you will weed out the competition. Um, and I, so I think that there is tremendous power that we can grant to the business. But if we're just sitting there soaking up money and, and having our fiefdom making everyone come ask us, people will, uh, the company will go out of business. Uh, uh, and I, I really, I cannot emphasize enough how much I would encourage you to read the Phoenix Project. Um, uh, IT is at a place today where it can truly enable uh, businesses to, uh, uh, to be revolutionary. They won't solve all the problems, but uh, there are so many things that IT can allow a business to do efficiently um, and uh, can make a huge difference in the competitive landscape. Um, uh, and if you don't think about it from an entire business perspective, I think you're losing out uh, and you're not, uh, you're not providing uh, value as an employee. Um, and I despise doing business talks. I, I would far rather talk about uh, esoteric things about infrastructure as a service. But I get the impression when I go around and talk to people that folks have no concept of the value that they're missing out on providing to their companies uh, and to the places they work at. Uh, and we've gotten into this um, being very comfortable uh, providing the no answer or the you must do it my way answer uh, continuously. So anyway, um, I'll be around uh, today if you want to uh, harass me, talk to me. Uh, uh, I, I again encourage you to read uh, The Phoenix Project. I think it will be the most important book you read this year. Um, thanks for sticking around and listening. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on-device, 
so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house, making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time, or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy-to-implement, easy-to-use, strong authentication. From Wicked. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources, and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people. Uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago. 
uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Well, stack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. And then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think Cloud Stack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the Cloud Stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on asterisks. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler, faster, and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.